Hello, this is Dr. Hena Asil, and this is Unit 3 of May 2020 in the Pearson Edexcel International AS level. So let us take a look at the questions and discuss the answer. It says a white crystalline anhydrous solid A contains one cation and one anion. Solid A was heated in a test tube and the following observations were made. A brown gas was produced. A glowing splint relit when placed in the mouth of the test tube and a white solid remained in the test tube. So identify by name or formula the two gases formed. Remember when we heat a solid and it gives a brown gas and a gas that relights a glowing splint, we're probably heating a metal nitrate. This gives the metal oxide, so that would be the white solid. It will give nitrogen dioxide, which is the brown gas. So the brown gas produces nitrogen dioxide. And a gas that relights a glowing splint, of course, the gas is oxygen. So identify the two gases. They are nitrogen dioxide and oxygen. And then he says, identify the anion present. That means that we started with something nitrate. Then he says, a flame test was carried out on A and a green color was observed. Identify by name or formula the cation present. Now, if I do flame test and I get a green color, that means we have which cation? Barium, yes, a green color would be due to barium ions. Give the formula of solid A and the formula of the white solid. We said solid A is what we started with. We found that it is barium and it is a nitrate, so its formula would be this formula for barium nitrate. Now, what was the white solid? Remember, he says when he heated it, he got a white solid. That means the white solid is barium oxide and please notice he wants the formula for each of these. About 5 cm cubed of an aqueous solution of A, which we have already decided is barium nitrate, was placed in each of two test tubes. Five drops of aqueous sodium hydroxide were added to one of the test tubes and five drops of dilute sulfuric acid were added to the other. So we are starting with barium nitrate, we are adding sodium hydroxide to it, if I add sodium hydroxide to barium nitrate, then what I get is barium hydroxide. Now, he also added the barium nitrate to dilute sulfuric acid and that means that he has barium sulfate. Now, what is he going to see? He says, give the observations. Now, if I add the barium nitrate to sodium hydroxide, I end up with barium hydroxide. Would that be a soluble or insoluble salt? Remember that barium is a large cation. If we have a large cation with a, a smaller anion, we said this would lead to ion polarization and this would ionize easily to form a solution so what we see is a colorless solution but barium sulfate is a salt that does not dissolve because these are a large cation with large anions so the, there is less ion polarization and what we see is a white precipitate that will not dissolve so remember that Actually, this is the test for sulfate. When we add barium nitrate on something like, that has sulfate like sulfuric acid, we should see barium sulfate, which is a white precipitate, uh, because this is a salt that does not dissolve easily. Question 2 says, a student was provided with aqueous solutions of four compounds. So he has hydrochloric acid, potassium carbonate, silver nitrate, sodium chloride. And he has the four bottles labeled B, C, D, and E. Each contained one of the solutions, but he does not know which solution is in which bottle. 
So the student mixed pairs of the solutions to determine which of them was in each bottle. So what did he do? He added so, uh, bottle B to bottle C and what he got is a white precipitate which did not dissolve on addition of dilute nitric acid. Now, if the precipitate does not dissolve when we add acid, then this precipitate is not due to carbonate. So we don't have anything carbonate in there, but we do have a solution that forms a white precipitate when added to the other one. So probably we have silver nitrate and HCl so that the silver nitrate with the HCl will give silver chloride and that will give a white precipitate that does not dissolve in dilute nitric acid. So let's say that it is silver nitrate and HCl. One of them is silver nitrate, the other is HCl. Now when I, he added B again to D, a precipitate formed which dissolved with effervescence on the addition of dilute nitric acid. Now, when the precipitate dissolves with effervescence with acid, that means that precipitate was a carbonate, and that means that we added to potassium carbonate, so we got a precipitate that dissolved in acid. Now, he brought B again, and he added it to another of the bottles, which he called E, and he got a white precipitate that did not dissolve again on addition of silver nitrate. So, uh, or nitric acid, sorry. So, if we decided that B is silver nitrate, then C is hydrochloric acid, D is potassium carbonate, and E would be the sodium chloride. Okay? Now, let's try the rest of them. If this is correct, then the rest would follow. So, C and D, which one is C and which one is D? That's acid with carbonate and he got effervescence with bubbles of a colorless gas given off, so that is correct. C and E, he got no change. What is C and E? That's HCl with sodium chloride. They wouldn't react with each other. D and E, no change. D and E, that's potassium carbonate with sodium chloride. That would not show any uh, change because the uh, compounds formed are all solid. Okay, so that means that when he put C and D, then that is the acid with the carbonate. So that would give effervescence with bubbles of colorless gas. So from all of these observations, we already decided that B is silver nitrate, C is HCl, D is potassium carbonate, and E is the sodium chloride. To identify the cations in sodium chloride and potassium carbonate, a student carried out flame tests. So he's trying to distinguish between sodium ions and potassium ions. A sample of solid sodium chloride was placed on a watch glass and a few drops of concentrated nitric acid were added. Remember, he's trying to carry out flame tests. And what he did is he put the sample of the solid on a watch glass and he added a few drops of concentrated nitric acid to the solid. Uh, the solid and the acid were mixed to form a paste. And then he brought a length of copper wire. He's doing flame test. A length of copper wire was dipped into the paste. A Bunsen burner was set up with the air hole closed. The copper wire containing the paste was placed into the Bunsen burner flame and the color observed. The procedure was repeated using the other compound potassium carbonate. Now, for each of these steps, give an improvement in the procedure. Of course, there are many things that are wrong with this procedure. So, give an improvement in the procedure explaining why the change is necessary. So, what's wrong with what he did? This is not how we do a flame test. In step one, he got the solid and added nitric acid and made it into a paste. Is this what we do when we're doing a flame test? Actually, the first step when we do a flame test is we should dip the wire in concentrated HCl to clean the wire and remove traces of previous samples. This is how we start a flame test. 
And then in step two, he used the copper wire. We don't use copper wire. We use something that is more inert, like platinum. So when we do a flame test, we use platinum wire. Copper may give a color that interferes with the results. Also in step three, he put the Bunsen burner with the air hole closed. That is not right. The air hole should be open so that the flame is hot and non-luminous. Remember, we say put the platinum wire with the uh, salt in it into the non-luminous flame of the Bunsen burner. Remember the Bunsen burner, if the air hole is closed, then the flame is not hot. And as we open the flame, when the holes are fully open, this is when we have a hot, non-luminous flame. And this is what we use for the flame test. Okay, question three says, this question is about three organic liquids, F, G, and H. Tests were carried out on F and G. Each liquid contained one functional group. The first test says a spatula measure of phosphorus chloride, this is PCL5 or phosphorus pentachloride, was added to about one centimeter cubed of each liquid in separate test tubes. Any gas evolved was tested with damp blue litmus paper. So when he added the PCL5 to F, he got steamy fumes and damp blue litmus paper turned red. Also, the same with G, he still got steamy fumes and damp blue litmus paper turned red. Now, I'm going to remind you, PCL5 is test for what? Remember that PCL5 is test for alcohols or acids, so something that has an OH, and it gives a steamy fume. Why? Identify by name or formula the steamy fumes. Remember that when you put PCL5 on alcohols or acids, you, got you get hydrogen chloride gas, and this appears in the form of steamy white fumes. So remember that PCL5 is a test for alcohols or acids. You get, in each case, you have hydrogen chloride gas, which appears in the form of white fumes or steamy fumes. About one centimeter cubed of sodium hydrogen carbonate was added to one centimeter cubed of each liquid. Of course, sodium hydrogen carbonate is something that we react with acids, not with alcohol. So when we put it on F, there is no reaction. And when we put it on G, we got a colorless gas was given off that turns lime water cloudy. Now identify the gas produced in test two. Of course, if I get a gas that turns lime water milky or cloudy, then that gas is carbon dioxide gas. So, based on our results, obviously F is the alcohol and G is the carboxylic acid. F and G both have a molar mass of 46, so draw the displayed formula of F and G. So if we say that F is an alcohol and its MR is 46, if you try it, you will find that this has to be ethanol and he wants the displayed formula. G, we decided, is a carboxylic acid. So which carboxylic acid will have an MR of 46? This has to be methanoic acid. If you calculate its MR, it comes out to 46. State whether or not it is possible to distinguish between F and G using infrared spectra. Of course, we said that F is ethanol. So this is an alcohol. An alcohol in the IR spectrum will have a broad peak for the OH, but there is no peak for C double bond O. G is an acid if we do the IR then the acid, which is G, would have a peak for the C double bond O, but the alcohol does not. So you can easily identify which one is an alcohol and which is an acid. The organic liquid H is a pheromone. 
thought to be involved in communication between rabbits. State the initial and final appearance of each mixture when the tests described were carried out on liquid H. If you look at liquid H, you notice that it is an alkene and at the same time it is an aldehyde. So it has an alkene group and an aldehyde group. Now, if we add a few drops of H uh, shaken with bromine water, you should know bromine water is test for what? For alkenes, and we do have alkenes, so when we add the bromine water to this liquid H, it the bromine water will turn from orange to colorless. In a test tube, a few drops of H were added to Benedict or Fehling. Benedict's or Fehling solution are test for what? They are test for aldehydes. And if I have an aldehyde, which I do have in H, the aldehyde or uh, the Fehling or Benedict originally is blue, it will turn from blue to brick red precipitate or orange red precipitate. Question 4 says the enthalpy change of neutralization of hydrochloric acid may be determined using the apparatus shown. The equation for the reaction is this. The procedure was he placed 25.0 cm cubed of 1 mole per decimeter cubed hydrochloric acid in a polystyrene cup. Record the temperature of the acid. Record the temperature of 30 centimeter cubed of one mole per decimeter cubed of sodium hydroxide. Add the sodium hydroxide to the hydrochloric acid in the polystyrene cup. Stare and record the maximum temperature. Now, first of all, give a reason why an excess of sodium hydroxide was used. Remember in this kind of questions, in this kind of experiments, when he says, why do we add excess sodium hydroxide? It is to make sure that all the acid has reacted. The diagram shows part of the thermometer when the temperature had reached its maximum. Record the temperature and complete the table. So what is the temperature in that diagram? If you look at that uh, diagram, you will find that the temperature is what? 27.5. Can you see that? So the temperature change would be the difference between the starting temperature and the, uh, temp uh, the maximum temperature. So the temperature change is 6. Remember all the data are in one decimal place. So your results must also be to one decimal place. So it should be 6.0, not just 6. Calculate the enthalpy change of neutralization of hydrochloric acid. Include a sign and units. Okay, so we're trying to get delta H. This is what he did. He put 25 centimeter cubed of 1 mole per decimeter cubed of HCl. And then he took 30 centimeter cubed of 1 mole per decimeter cubed sodium hydroxide. And the temperature change was 6 degrees. Celsius. So what should we do first? In order to get delta H, we first get Q. Q is MC delta T. So what is M? M is the mass of the solution. And remember what we had was 25 centimeter cubed of acid plus 30 centimeter cubed of sodium hydroxide. So my total solution is 55 grams. Remember, 55 centimeter cubed of solution. We assume this is water, density is 1. So the volume is the same as the mass. So M is 55 times C, which is 4.2. That's uh, um, something that's constant. And delta T, that's the temperature change. That is 6. Remember that what comes out from this equation is in joules. So we should actually divide by 1,000 to get it in kilojoules. Then we put this into the equation for delta H. And you should know that delta H is Q over N. So I need to get the number of moles of HCl. Of course, at HCl, number of moles would be concentration times volume. Remember, the volume has to be in decimeter cubed. So we divided the 25 by 1,000. 
and we got the number of moles of HCl. Now we can get delta H. Delta H is Q over N. So it's the uh, 1.386 kilojoules over the number of moles that we calculated. Then the number that comes out here is in kilojoule per mole. It must have a sign. Why did we decide that it is minus? Remember that there was a temperature rise. There was an increase in temperature. So that means that this reaction is exothermic. So the delta H is a negative value. The experiment was repeated using a glass beaker instead of polystyrene cup. Explain how the value obtained for the entropy change would be different. Remember, we are supposed to do these kinds of experiments in a polystyrene cup. The, any experiment involving measuring of temperature, then we sh should do it in polystyrene cup. And you should know that that is because the polystyrene is an insulator, so there will be less loss of heat to the uh, surroundings. He's now saying, I'm going to do it in a glass beaker. That's not a good idea because the glass beaker, there will be loss of heat to the environment. That means the value for delta H he calculates will be smaller. So it, it will be less exothermic since the polystyrene is a better insulator. So there will be less loss of heat to the surroundings with the polystyrene than with the beaker. A student carried out an experiment to identify metal M in the hydrated carbonate M2CO3 10 water. A solution was made by dissolving 3.56 grams of the hydrated metal carbonate in distilled water, making the volume up to 250 centimeter cubed in a volumetric flask. 25 centimeter cubed of this solution was placed in a conical flask, titrated with 0.1 mole per decimeter cubed of hydrochloric acid. The equation for the reaction is this. Name a suitable piece of apparatus to measure the 25.0 centimeter cubed of solution. Remember, to measure 25.0 centimeter cubed of solution, we use a pipette. Methyl orange indicator was used in this titration. Give the color change in the conical flask. Remember, this is the colors that we get for methyl orange. Now, what did we put into the flask? Let's go back just a little bit. He put what? He put the uh, metal carbonate in the flask. And that means I am starting with the solution in the flask yellow and then it will change to neutral which is orange remember you should see what he had in the flask if he started with acid then it would start from red to orange but he started with the carbonate solution so that is from yellow to orange the results of the titration are shown and the first thing he says is complete the table. Of course, if I have final burette reading and initial burette reading, so for each titration, I just subtract the final minus the initial and get the uh, volume of acid used. Now, using appropriate titrations, calculate the mean. Remember, to calculate the mean or the average, which of these should we use? We should use the ones that have results within 0.2 of each other. So which ones are within 0.2 of each other? Titration 2 and titration 3 are within 0.2 of each other. The titration 1 is too far off. So we do not include it in the average. So the average is just the average of titration 2 and 3, so that comes out to 24.9 centimeter cubed. Then he says, using your answer, calculate the number of moles of HCl in the mean titer. What did he have? He had the HCl was what? He put 25 centimeter cubed in the flask. He titrated it with 0.1 mole per decimeter cubed of HCl. And the titer he got was 24.9. So that means the concentration of HCl was 0.1. 
the volume was 24.9. So, the number of moles is concentration times volume. So, this gives me the number of moles of HCl that was used. Now, calculate the number of moles of M2CO3. This was the equation. And you should realize that the number of moles of M2CO3 should be half the number of moles of HCl. So, if we get the number of moles, it is half of what we got for the HCl. Then he says, this is the number of moles in 25 centimeter cube, because what he titrated was 25 centimeter cubed of the solution was titrated with the HCl, but he wants the number of moles in the whole 250. So, if this is in 25, so how much in 250? You multiply by 10. This gives me the number of moles in the total solution of methyl carbonate. Then he says, use your answer and the mass. Remember, the mass was 3.56 grams in the 250. Calculate the MR of the methyl carbonate. So, we have... The MR should be the mass which he put, so that's 3.56, over the number of moles we calculated, so we get that the MR is about 286. Now, use that to identify M. We know that the formula is M2CO3, 10 water, that's what he told us. And we found that the MR of all of this is 285.9, and I can deduce the um, value for the metal alone, for the metal ion alone. I have two of the M's plus the rest make up 285.9. So the 2M, I can calculate for it and I can get M. We got M is 23. We look at the periodic table, which one has a mass number of 23. We found that that is then he says the titration was repeated without using an indicator. Describe how you would obtain large dry crystals of metal chloride from this titration solution. So basically we have the solution and we're trying to get crystals. So you're supposed to explain crystallization. So what we're going to say is we're going to say heat the solution to point of crystallization, cool to form crystals and then we're supposed to filter the crystals through filter paper and funnel and dry the crystals between filter papers so you get dry crystals of the metal chloride and that's the end of this paper i hope this was useful to you uh, please share the video and thank you for listening